morning, everyone. I need to find my presentation here. Okay, so thank you for having me. Um, so I'll just start with how I kind of got into this. Um, I, I was reading about driverless vehicles, it was about two and a half years ago, and I became really interested in them because what I quickly learned is that they are coming very, very quickly, and in fact, it's gonna appear in a second. Yeah, okay. And in fact, this is, this is something that really resonated for me. If you can't read it, it says driverless cars are closer than they appear. Um, it really hit me that driverless cars are coming very, very soon, but what was interesting as I was reading news articles, which is really the main source of information around them, is that there was very little focus on what the government should be doing. Um, you read all about Google and the car makers and who's gonna come up with the technology first. You know, it's always a race, um, but very little on the government. So um, I applied for an internal research fellowship and I got it and basically spent about a year and a half researching driverless vehicles from the, the view of how government can plan for them. And it, what was great is that at the time when I started it, government, it wasn't on the radar at all. I mean, at the federal government level, um, federal government had done almost nothing at that point. And certainly at the state and local level, there was almost no mention. So um, now, thankfully, it's, it's on the government's radar, and, and we'll, you'll hear a lot more about that. But, um, so what I'm gonna do very quickly is some background on driverless vehicles. Um, I'll outline what I see as two potential extreme futures with driverless vehicles. And, and then finally, I'll talk about what government can and should be doing. So first of all, driverless vehicles 101. So one of the things that the federal government did was to define driverless vehicles. So NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, came out with this definition. And, and really the key parts of this is that the driver will provide destination or navigation input, but they will not be available um, for con to take over control at any other part of the trip. So the driver, the driver in quotes, can literally be sleeping. And um, actually, I'm, I lost a slide there, but um, this is a better view of what that quote was. Um, the graphic here is something from Mercedes. It's kind of a futuristic view of what driverless vehicles could look like on the inside. And, and what it demonstrates is how it could completely um, challenge what our traditional notions are of how a car is designed and how we sit in the cars. So um, that is just one of many renderings that are out there. Um, the other thing that NHTSA did was establish different levels of automation. So level zero is literally the way that driver cars were when they first came out. So you step on a brake when you want to stop, you turn the steering wheel when you want to turn. Um, and that goes all the way up to level four, which is a dr the driver can literally be sleeping. They, the driver is not needed. These in-between levels reflects where, what, what we're seeing today, which is the introduction of partial automation. So we're starting to see in cars the ability to self-park, um, adaptive cruise control, um, just that the, the car is able to do some things automated and some things not. So um, my research has really been focused on level four, full automation, but what we're finding is that um, these are being introduced gradually. So I'm gonna show you a quick video and Hoping this works. And the question for you all is, is this a level four fully automated vehicle? And I don't know if you can see it, but that is a sleeping person in the car. He's fast asleep. So any guesses? No. No, no. no. that's right. So um, this is an example of a partially automated car where a person should not be sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> but they are, and that, that is a huge concern for the industry right now is that um, things like what Tesla has with autopilot, these are vehicles that have partial automation, but we as humans think, wow, this is great, it can do it all for me. And, and that's actually illegal what this person is doing now. So, um, all right. So, as I mentioned, there is quite the race to driverless, and it's not just between the, automake, uh, between the automakers and the technology developers, you know, Ford, Audi, um, Google, Tesla, everyone is out there with a new headline of who's got it, who has it coming out first. It's also between cities, between states, between countries. Um, it's a really interesting time and everybody wants you know, to take the trophy. But um, the real question is when are they coming? So this is a graphic from Morgan Stanley and what it shows is that we expect to see driverless vehicles become publicly available in the 2018 to 2020 timeframe. So that is literally in two to four years. Um, 
uh, that I think is really important because um, that means that even though they're going to start to become available, it doesn't mean that we're going to just see like pervasiveness around society. This graphic forecasts 100% penetration of driverless vehicles by 2026, which is 10 years from now. Um, I happen to love showing this graphic because that is by far the most aggressive estimate that's out there. Um, but that being said, I mean, we've even seen it with the adoption of smartphone technology. Um, these things can happen very quickly. So um, that being said, I would say the average in terms of forecasts that we see out there show like 30 to 40 percent penetration in the 2030 time frame. I think the most important thing to take away from this, though, is that most government plans look out 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and not many of them even acknowledge automated vehicles. So um, this, you know, while aggressive, does kind of show you how soon they're coming. So what's the point of these vehicles? Why should the government care, I guess is the question. And, and the number one reason is the, the potential for improved safety. Um, right now, 90% of accidents that happen on our roadways are due to human error. So think drunk driving, distracted driving, speeding. Um, when you have a vehicle that eliminates the human, you have the potential to eliminate all of those accidents. The other big one is the uh, potential for increased mobility. So Google has uh, done a lot to promote you know, the blind guy getting into the vehicle and him being able to get around. It's very interesting when California DMV came out with regulations in the last six months um, that required a steering wheel and brakes and for a driver to be able to take over control at any time. It was actually the disabled community that came out in full force to protest that because it has such an impact on their, their group. And, and finally, the potential for reduced car ownership. So what if this two-car garage was able to become more of this like Uber and Lyft-like society? And I like to take the Uber icon out and put a public agency into this phone because it's important to reflect the fact that there are different business models that we are likely going to see with how these vehicles actually do provide the service. So what's, what's keeping driverless vehicles from happening right now? So the technology is obviously one piece of it. And then the question is also, how ready does the technology need to be? Um, but other things are like human factors. Um, how many of you would get into a driverless vehicle right now if there was one waiting for you outside? What a, a progressive audience. Now, that actually, that you, it was probably like 50%. That's actually pretty close to where um, we are as a country in terms of readiness, but it ranges significantly based on age of people, where you live. I gave this talk in Connecticut, which is where I'm from, to about a room of about 200 people, and I had one person willing to get into a driverless vehicle, so you just never know. Um, but that is a huge piece, and it's actually the industry is really recognizing, is the um, need for humans to actually be willing to get into the vehicles, and, and people on both the public sector side and private sector side are really starting to invest in this. Um, just skipping around, another major issue is the privacy and security. Who's going to own and protect the travel data? Um, who's going to make sure that these cars are not taken over by terrorists and driven into buildings? Um, this is something the federal government is investing a good amount of money in right now. Um, and then another big one is insurance. Who's liable if a driverless vehicle gets into an accident with another driverless vehicle, or even more complicated, with a non-driverless vehicle? Um, where, where does the fault lie? So these are all some very interesting questions that are being studied um, by many, many different people, including academic institutions. Um, but the government's role is really what I started to focus on and I got really interested in, so I'll talk about that more in a second. So um, in terms of our future, I like to lay out two very extreme futuristic scenarios, purposely extreme for the purposes of demonstration. So um, imagine like fast forward 50 years from now, we have all driverless vehicles. So what does that look like? So I'm, first scenario, scenario one, um, imagine that I'm a suburban mom. I live out you know, 15 miles outside of a city. Um, I wake up on a Monday morning, get my kids ready for school, and then I summon my private driverless vehicle to come and pick me up. So it shows up at my door, I put my kids into the vehicle, and the vehicle takes my kids to school. Then when the car comes back, I'm ready to go, so I get in so that the car can take me to work. Um, I, I get into the car, it has a coffee maker, an elliptical trainer so I can get my workout in. Um, it has a big screen TV, and then you know after I get my workout in, I sit and I watch some TV and I get some, start getting some work done. And I'm probably sitting in traffic for a lot of that, but I really don't care because I have the luxury of this vehicle and everything I could need inside of it. So then I, I get to the office, 
I realize I don't have any groceries for dinner that night. So I send the vehicle out to run my errands for me. So while I'm at work, I, I tell the car to go to one store for produce, because it's the cheapest there, a different store for meat, and another store for toilet paper, because I got the cheapest deals at each one of these stores. <laughs> And then once the vehicle is done picking up all of those things, it drives to a remote parking lot about 15 miles outside of the city to wait for its next assignment. So, so that's scenario one. You'll notice that there is definitely no public transportation involved in that. Um, well, it's actually a pretty scary scenario. A lot of people think of that as like the dream. I have had a lot, after the TED talk actually, I had at least 10 different moms come up to me and say that was exactly what I want to have happen in my future. <laughs> and and, and I, I said, that's not the point, that's not what I was trying to say. <laughs> um, but the issue is, you're now instead of just having single occupancy vehicle trips, you're actually adding a lot of zero occupancy vehicle trips to the road. And on top of that, there's no pub minimal tr public transportation. So it's kind of the selfish scenario, but not too different from how we use cars today. So, so that's scenario one. Scenario two um, is quite the opposite. So imagine the exact same thing. I wake up on a Monday morning, I get my kids ready for school, and then I get them onto a driverless school bus. And the bus takes them to school. And then when I'm ready to go, I use my smartphone and I summon um, a pod to come pick me up. And this driverless pod picks me up, picks up a couple of my neighbors, and then takes me to the local train station. And there, it's timed perfectly. So I get out of the pod, I immediately get onto the train, and the whole thing is paid for seamlessly. And then I get to the downtown, um, get on a bike share bike for that last mile, and then head into my office. So similarly, I realize I don't have any groceries for dinner that night, so I use my smartphone and I schedule food delivery for that evening. Um, I'm sure a lot of you today use Instacart and that kind of thing, so not too crazy from how we work today. So, so that's scenario two. So really, the big difference between these two is the level of sharing that's happening, the level of vehicle and ride sharing. And I do believe our reality is going to be somewhere in the middle. Um, but the key with this is that I actually think that it's the government's policies and plans that are put in place that will influence where we fall on this <coughs> spectrum. So um, just very quickly to compare these two scenarios, and some of these are controversial and that's just fine, I'm happy to argue them. Um, so in terms of comparing these two scenarios, so I have the nightmare scenario on the left, hopefully you know which one is which, and then the utopian scenario on the right. So when it comes to safety, safety is gonna be drastically improved no matter what because we have um, all driverless vehicles. Vehicle miles traveled could be way, way, way worse with the nightmare scenario, but it actually is likely to be still worse with the utopian scenario. That's what most forecasters are saying. Just when you consider the level of trips that are still going to happen to pick people up and, you know, time when there's no one in the car. Um, greenhouse gas emissions, so this is probably one of the more controversial ones, but I will just say most forecasts assume that driverless vehicles are going to be electric. And that is a huge assumption. It's a huge leap of faith to make because they are two totally different technologies. So um, I think it's really important from a government perspective when forecasting these things, you know, that is a policy that needs to be put in place to be able to influence how that happens. Um, urban sprawl, there is the risk with driverless vehicles that people are willing to live farther from where they work. Whereas in the utopian scenario, in theory, people would, would live in denser, richer transit communities so that they don't have to do these long commutes in a private vehicle. Um, parking requirements, I say no change for the nightmare scenario. Um, the biggest change, I, there would be a change, likely is that parking could be relocated. So as I said, the, the remote parking lots, you might be able to move parking lots outside of the urban areas and away since the, the vehicles can travel to them. Um, and then on the utopian side, there would be a significant decrease in the parking requirements, could be, which could be huge for our um, d both downtown and suburban communities if that parking can go down. Roadway maintenance requirements. Um, in theory, it would go down in both cases because driverless vehicles are expected to have smoother acceleration and deceleration. Um, however, with the increase in VMT, um, the nightmare scenario would, in theory, have less, it would have um, still more roadway maintenance requirements than the, the utopian. And finally, low income mobility. Public transportation is really at the heart of the utopian scenario and the idea is that it would be something that the government invests in and really makes rich and reliable and, and frequent. And in the nightmare scenario, there is the risk that public transportation just goes away. And, and that is something that I don't believe is fully gonna happen, but I think that is a risk. So jumping into what can governments do. So um, as Maurice mentioned, I developed a guide. I have about 10 that I can give away after this, but um, in the guide I laid out what government agencies can do 
in the short, medium, and long term. So just to start, I, ha I, th I thought the first thing I needed to do was break down what should the federal government be focused on versus state and local. And the idea is that at the federal level, you want to see consistency across the states. You do not, you do not want to have different requirements around, for example, licenses. I mean, are driverless li drive, driving licenses still going to be needed? Um, are seatbelt requirements going to change? I mean, these are things you do not want to have to, the auto manufacturers are not going to want to develop differently state by state. Um, same with the privacy of data um, sharing, cybersecurity. These are all things you want to see consistently around the country. On the other hand, the state and local role, you're going to want to see those jurisdictions focused on the things that are unique to their region. So mobility, how do they want to manage that vehicle miles traveled impact? Um, on the infrastructure side, you know, are you going to have to add more kiss and ride drop-off points at your transit stations to be able to get more share, to enable more sharing? Um, where are you going to move parking to? You know, how are you going to manage that parking demand? So these are all infrastructure impacts. Um, transit, I, I like to say transit even today is going through an identity <coughs> crisis to figure out how to manage this kind of, even with you know, the Uber and Lyfts of the world and other private companies coming into what's traditionally been a public sector space. Transit needs to figure out its role in all of this, and I think that's that much more important as driverless vehicles come in because the private sector is very much coming into this space and, and providing comparable services. And then the financial piece. Um, you know, this is something that's often overlooked, but there are going to be huge financial <laughs> implications for government agencies. Um, think about speeding ticket revenues. Speeding tickets could completely go away, and there are towns in our country that rely on that. Um, another big one is um, sales tax revenues coming, that come with like vehicle purchases. If people are going to buy less vehicles, the sales tax revenues that come from that could go down. So there's, there's really like a laundry list of, of financial implications. So what can be done now? I'm just going to highlight a few of these. Um, the number one thing I think government agencies can do is to build up their own awareness about what's going on. This is, it's been a super exciting place for me and I think all of us on the panel because the news changes daily. I mean, there's something new and crazy going on around the world with driverless vehicles, not new things being tested. There are driverless shuttles on the roads today around the world. Um, Singapore just introduced driverless taxis. I mean, it's, it is literally disrupting the entire transportation space. So keeping up with what's going on and then helping to build awareness around the agencies and with your public is really, really important. The other thing is to start to incorporate driverless vehicles into your plans, into your goals. Um, even if you don't know exactly what the future is going to be, acknowledging that they're coming and then starting to lay out where it could impact things is really important. Um, and I'll, I'll keep going from that. And then what can be done in the medium and long term? Um, from the planning perspective, starting to look at your travel demand model, you know, government agencies, most of them maintain a travel demand model. And most of them do not even incorporate Uber and Lyft when you think about what the extreme consequences already have been on, on transportation. But um, by updating travel demand models, even with these extreme scenarios, you can start to look at what my road capacity needs might be, how might parking requirements change, um, and then look at what, how that impacts transit. Um, on the infrastructure side, I will just say, and I love to skip to this because there, there are quite a few in, infrastructure impacts even though driverless vehicles don't actually speak to the infrastructure, they don't rely on the infrastructure in the same way that connected vehicles do, um, driverless vehicles um, will still have some changes. It might be changing the traffic signalization. It might be changing, updating your lane, lane markings and making sure that they are able to be read by the driverless vehicles. But one of the most controversial things that I have in my guide is the idea of certifying roads so that driverless vehicles can operate on them. When I sent this guide out for review around to both public and private sector, um, this was by far one of the most controversial things in that some people said, well, absolutely, why would anyone trust getting into a driverless vehicle if the government has, <coughs> hasn't certified that a road is able to or that it's dedicated just to driverless or just to non-driverless? And then government agencies were saying, well, we don't have the money to do that. We don't want to be liable if something goes wrong on that road. Um, there, there were quite a few reasons against it. Um, but I kept it in just because there were so many people that came out and said, absolutely, it's the only way we're going to see driverless vehicles come into our society. So it, it is a controversial thing. And another one I'll highlight, which is under the miscellaneous category, is the importance of updating the government workforce to be able to reflect the skill sets needed to manage this disruption. Um, one thing is that a ton of new data is going to be available. So the government's going to need to be in a position to establish policies to be able to actually access that data and then have skills to be able to do something with the data. I mean, I, it's amazing how many government agencies today are fighting for 
um, data, for example, like from Uber and Lyft, and they don't necessarily have the skills to be able to do anything with it, or what do they want to do with it is the question. So I think that's really important. And then finally, and this is my all-time favorite slide, which I'll do very quickly, um, when I said that there's this spectrum where we're likely going to fall between the utopian and nightmare scenario, it's really going to be government policy that influences where um, the society falls in that spectrum. And, you know, it's going to be important to put out policies that will manage the, the VMT impact. So um, putting things like HOV lanes and road user charging and things where people actually understand that the more they travel, the more they pay or, the, their, the, or maybe their incentives for sharing rides. These are all ways to make sure that we lean more towards that utopian scenario. Um, and the other thing I'll mention is changing transit pricing. You know, Uber and Lyft may be cheap now, but it's only going to get cheaper when there are no drivers in them. And it's going to be super important that public transit stays competitive, and pricing is one of the best ways it can stay competitive. Um, so I could go on and on. The guide has a lot more. It's available online, too. I will just say the biggest takeaway that I like people to walk away with is that government really has an important role to play. Private sector is going to advance this technology with or without government. And it is so important to realize the importance of um, what this is going to do for our society, both the positives and the potential neg negatives, and that the government has a role in influencing that. So with that, oops, sorry, I'll leave you with my contact information. And there is a link to the guide. You can also just Google it. It's a lot easier to Google it. It's called Driving Towards Driverless. And, um, and my blog, and I, I tweet about driverless vehicles all the time, so if you're looking for a way to stay up to date on um, these news articles, that can be a great way. So thank you very much, and I look forward to questions.